Hit the right button there now. There we go. Hit the right button. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Saturday Night Live here with me, Peter Driver from Biscari Fly. How you doing, Dylan? Dylan from Wales there. Dave Donovan's on there. Declan Smith, Kieran Sherlock, Alan Lawless, Pat Hoare is on there with us. Who else have we got? Declan Noonan, Johnny Gambranigan, Patrick Burke, Liam Long, Kevin Coyne, Declan Smith, Martin O'Rourke, James Hope, Darius. Good to see you today, Darius. Josh. I uh, hope everybody's keeping well. Hope every how you doing, Steve? Ricky is on there as well. Patrick Smith, how you doing? Patrick David Reed. Hope everybody's keeping well. Everyone had a good week. Uh, another week closer to the trout season. We're getting there now. I was talking to Dave Donovan today, and he had the file out, and he was sharpening up the hooks, getting ready to go down there on the Blackwater. Um, so it's it's close now, folks, and it won't be long. Great to be. Getting through January and uh, how you doing Billy Bowl and George Burgess is on there as well. Graham Lonigan, Jim Myler. Hope everyone's keeping well. Great to be getting out this side of uh, January and uh, looking forward to a bit of fishing coming up now. 15th of Tom Ankertel, uh, Bernard, Allen, Colm. Great to see so many people on with us. Um, so I hope everyone's keeping well. So tonight we got a nice little lineup for you. We're on midnight tonight. So as you can see, the little hook and device, size 22. They're going to be small ones tonight, folks. Midge fishing is something not that I run away from, but I kind of do when I have to. But uh, we also have a special guest on with us tonight who's going to talk about midge fishing on the shore. Okay, and really worked a really great interview with uh, the legendary um, George McGrath, who does a lot of midge fishing on the shore on the flats and gets a lot of success with it. So George came on there last night. We did a bit of a, a chat with him. Um, how you doing, Mike? Uh, Kevin Hamill's on there as well. Good stuff, Mike McGovern. Must give you a ring during the week there. See how you're getting on there in New York. Um, but um, <coughs> George does a lot of midge fishing on the flats and he had some very interesting um, comments and thoughts on it there um, last night. So well worth watching. That one's coming up. Dave is going to be on with Heidi and Mikey Foley. I am keeping well and I hope you are too. Down there in Limerick. Kilmallock. All ready for the season, Mikey. You won't be long down there now either. Heidi and Seamus Roach. Is on with us there as well. So, um, yeah, George coming on a little while. Dave will be on with his trivia tonight. We've got a lovely prize for you tonight, lads and ladies. Um, Ned Maher from Adair Springs kindly offered a one-day voucher for whoever wins the trivia tonight um, to go down for a, def, a day's fishing on Ned in Adair Springs. A fabulous fishery. Of course, it's the host venue for this year, Irish Springs Angling Fair. It's going to be a massive fair. Um, check out their website www.irishanglingspringsfair.com don't forget to book your tickets online you could win a VIP weekend but that's going to be a massive weekend on the 30th of April to the 1st of May we'll be down there with everything I do Bernard Graham is on there as well Steve how you doing <laughs> yeah it is and I tell you I've tried to I've tried to um, someone's just saying about the focus on the hooks as you can see when I kind of put my hand behind it it's not as bad I think I might need to change the colour t-shirt um for the smaller stuff. But yeah, the, the hook is a size 22. Very, very small in the voice. I've zoomed it in as far as I could zoom. And uh, it focuses a little bit off. It's it's, it's, it's difficult to focus on stuff that small. Um, but we'll do our best anyway. I hope he's making it out. So we're going to start with a little. How you doing, Brian Kennedy? Owen is on there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Great meeting yourself as well. And Emma Owen today. Uh, great old chat there with Owen and Emma. Uh, just recently moved home from British Columbia. Um my first question was why? <laughs> why did he move home? But anyway, lovely, lovely folks. Great to have his back. So I've got a size 22 Vivaris little dry fly hook there in the vice. And I'm going to add on a small little bit of black tying thread. So the first one is when it comes to midges, they're small. You know, you're talking every turn. How are you doing, Jerry? Jared Lennon's on there as well. Uh, you're talking every turn of trade counts. Really every turn of trade counts. There is no, you know, there's no overdressing the midge. It's got to be minimalistic. It's got to just do exactly what you want it to do. Be very small. Sit where you need it to sit. And hopefully be as effective as you can. Okay. Uh, we won't talk too much about tactics. There's a, a far more person with expertise than me coming on there. So I'm just taking a bit of... Uh, um, good stuff, John. Uh, I'm just taking a little bit of Scary Floyd Parapost. And as you can see, I'm ripping off about a third. Which is probably even too much of this. We're going to go even smaller. Um, about a quarter. Of the size that Hank. And it'll just. This is a little clink hammer by the way. Kind of a little. How you doing Miles Riley? Good to have you on. Uh, yeah tonight's, tonight's show is. How you doing Elaine? Yeah absolutely tiny. I was going to do the 30s. And I thought well if I do 30s. No one would see it. And I could just move my hands. And then just say hey there it is lads. Ladies you can all see it. But I said I'll go a little bit bigger. And I'll stick to the 22s and 20s. But anyway. Little little kind of parachute clink hammer. How you doing Ross Enright? 
Declan, Declan Pigot it is. How you doing, David Hannaford? Uh, it is small. These are from midges. So we're on midges. Now, you know, during, during the summer months, midges become quite um quite a good opportunity for trout to, to feed up on and get a um you know, and if you're good at your midge fishing and you're you're um confident enough at your midge fishing, well it can be proved to be very, very successful. Uh, especially in those flats, you know. How you doing, Michael Callaghan? How are you doing, Kevin? Kevin Buckley's on with us there as well. Can be very, very successful, you know. But it does take a bit of confidence. It does take a bit of set. You know, your setup needs to be adjusted accordingly towards it. So just a little bit of black trade, small and black. Couldn't get any simpler. Just take your time with them, you know. This there's not much to tie in small stuff like this. I got a little bit of black. small little bit of black hackle there not even going to tie it up the post it doesn't need it this little fly is going to be so light one turn not one and a half not two one one turn around one good turn around that post one full turn get your tread in there keep the tension on the tread use the stem of the hackle to guide that tread up into the in, in between the eye and the stalk. Bit of a squeeze on the tread there just to get it in. I'll trim it off close, but I won't trim it all the way for the moment. How you doing, Kevin Maher, James Hope? They can be very fiddly, um, but uh, look, at they're, they're worth having. They're worth having, folks. They will take. Now, the typical type of water that you're fishing this kind of stuff in is on the flats. And an awful lot of anglers, myself included, by the way, have got into the habit of going to the going to the runs, fishing all the runs. I forget about those. I just kind of hold the hook a little bit to take the pressure of that uh, whip finish when I go try to lock it up a bit. Aye. Now I'm going to get in there and it's going to take away that last little bit of stem. There we have it. One turn of hackle, little midge. You will see it, trust me. It will float. Take off your post. And a simple little thing like that can be deadly, as you can see. How's it going? Neil is on with us there as well. Wayne, good to have you on there, Wayne. Simple little clink, nothing fancy, but very, very effective. And an awful lot of the, you know, real good, successful midge patterns. Are exactly like that just really really simple how you doing andrew um really simple little midge patterns fish that on probably point me probably point zero six tippet uh which would be eight nine x um is what i normally fish it on um and it uh, just sit beautifully in the water there's our first one tonight folks hope you enjoy don't forget you can win all tonight's flies and i did a couple there earlier on as well in the tub win all those flies tonight by just sharing the stream so hit that share button on the stream and I'll do a draw on Wednesday as usual. Dave will be along in a little while with his uh, quiz. But you can see that now. Lovely little fly. You'll see that quite this way. You'll be quite surprised. Um, and they can be tied down if you want to tackle them. They can be tied right down to 30s. If you want to tackle those little little clink or parachute, whichever you prefer to call it. No tail. Midges don't have tails. Um, small little black. Small and black is, is always a good good combination. Um <laughs> Absolutely, Ricky. So small and black is always a good combination for midges. Now there's lots of other small stuff on the rivers too. There's canis, there's that kind of stuff. Um, you know, the curse of the canis, they're, they're next to impossible to imitate. Uh next to impossible, especially on rivers, whatever about lakes. Um Jim Myler, they could, they could. If you know what, I, I I talked to one of the a great angler one time. And he said to me, you know, it's about fishing small, micro stuff like that for big trout. Uh, I'll worry about that when I get the trout on the hook. If he straightens, he straightens. But until then, I'll worry about it. What I do do, though, folks, is when I'm making my leaders, if I'm going down fishing stuff that small, and I'm even just going down... Um, <laughs> good man, John Keller was getting them on the air springs today. Good man, John. Um, but what I do do is I make up the leader for it if I'm going really, really small, be it really micro nymphs or small little dries like that. And I'll boil, I'll make up the leader on a maximum or camel fill. And I'll boil it for maybe four and a half minutes in, 
in boiling water. And that's simmering boiling water. Coil it up, make it up, leave the knots, leave little tag ends on the knots. Don't trim them off till you boil it because sometimes they shrink and when you give a bit of pressure on that, it can give it that moment. So just leave a little bit in, coil it up around your fingers, loop it up nice and clean into boiling water, four and a half minutes for stuff that size. And the stretch and the spring that you would put into that, um, <laughs> the stretch when, the stretch that comes into that um, leader will help, you know, will act as a shock leader. Uh, that and probably a two weight rod. And you, you have a chance, but as uh, um, that guy once said to me, he said, I'll worry about it when I get the throat on the hook first or bring him up to the rise. Then I'll try and figure that bit out. Um, you know, so if, if the trout ran him, what can you do? You have to go with it. Uh, you'll be quite surprised how strong those little hooks are once they get in there. You know, um, you'll be quite surprised. So there's the first one tonight. Now, next one we're going to do is another little, lovely little midge. Now, a very popular uh, little midge is, or an imitation of a midge, is the Griffith's gnat, which is a representation of bawling buzzers on a river. Okay, which is when a group of buzzers come together and, you know, there's, there's other there's other flies for the locks. There's like um, the grizzle baby o and stuff like that, which is very good for lock style fishing when, when the... Um, when the buzzers ball up. But on the river, it's the Griffiths now. Fantastic fly. Not even when there's midges, but also when there's um, just a rise of trout on bases. This is size 20 D, uh, to Haku 301 on this particular one. Now, we're going to switch to Kevlar. Um, sorry, Jonathan Murray. So, that is a um, Vivaris size 22. Feather light dry. For that little one. And we have these in the shop. We also have them right down to 30s. Okay, so if anybody really wants to get into it, um, give us a shout here in Piscari Fly, and uh, we have all of them in the shop there at the moment. Uh, this time I'm going to go to Kevlar. Kevlar is very good. This this Piscari Fly Kevlar for tying the likes of the smaller stuff because it's so flat. Sits uh, Dave is as on there, folks. Question coming up soon. Watch out for that one. It's so flat and uh, it's so fine. You know, you get those extra couple of turns in to give you that little bit of um, oh, what would you call it? confidence in your tying that you're not just literally doing as little as possible so here i got a very fine lovely little midge uh grizzle saddle as you can see lovely little cape this one uh picked up a few years ago off pat nolan i'd say and we're going to tie this in here to butt so this is a very similar little tie into a griffith's net just a little bit different okay so we're going to tie you've probably seen it before we're going to tie in a couple of turns that there now to butt two to three turns And then tie it off. Just there in the, in the butt. Cut off your thread. Or cut, sorry, cut off your waist tackle. Don't cut the thread. A little bit of, uh, thanks Aiden. Uh, a little bit of Hens Spectre Dubbin number 46 going in here. Hi to all our YouTubers, by the way, tomorrow. We did, we figured out the whole thing. I know there was a little bit of a mix up there over the last week or two. How you doing, Tony? Good to have on. Good to have you on with us tonight. Uh, there was a little mix-up or two there over the last two weeks with um, trying to take the videos down off the Saturday Night Live show and putting them up on... Uh, putting them up on the YouTube, but we actually managed to get it sorted there. So all, we're up to date now on the on the whole lot. So I have a little small piece of that double. And just where you started off that... I'm just going to add in a small little piece of that, as you can see. Okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to take a black marker. And I'm going to colour up my Kevlar for a second here. See why I'm going to do that now in a second. Small bit of colour on that. Darken it up a bit. Give it a little bit of a spin, just to tighten it up there. And I'm going to go back down over that peacock dome to get it nice and slim. And nice and tight. Okay, we then go back to our grizzle, and we're going to add in the exact same thing up at the head. So basically, it's like two little midges together. Very, very effective little fly. Also, what can be very effective, John, I know I've tied him for these before, is ants. Little ants can be super effective as well um, at the time of year when, when midges and stuff are out that high summer. Dave is on there now. So LOBO is the abbreviation acronym for what midge dry fly? Great question, Dave. The winner of that's going to win themselves a free day in Adair Springs whenever they want. 
First correct answer in, Dave, is it? On the stream? David, keep an eye on that one. Let me know who it is. And there we have it. Another very simple, very effective little midge pattern. These are great. We should do midge nights every week. Um, they're so fast. <laughs> they're so fast. We'll have nothing to do after half nine. But um, there we go. That's another little midge pattern. You can see a little bit of peacock dubbing is kind of just not sitting right in the bottom. I should have got over that with a piece of thread. I can just push my scissors point in there and get it. But it's still going to be very effective. Good stuff, Bernard. Uh, there we go. Lovely little midge pattern. Very simple again. You know, you don't need to overdo them, overdress them. Nothing else at all. Um, but a real effective little midge pattern. And that one's on a size 20. A little bit easier to see that one. You can tie that if you've got the good grizzle saddles. Um, you can tie that. You can tie that on any size you want. This is a, a, a say, um, a whitening's uh, fine midge. Uh, very fine barbs and that's going into the box there for anyone that wants to um, win those prizes there during the week okay folks well look at Dave's asked his question there we're waiting for the winner to come in Dave will give me a shout back but in the meantime before we go on and tie any more midges now I've got another three little midge patterns coming after the break but I had a good conversation last night with the one and only George McGrath from the River Shore George a fantastic gang down there great dry fly man uh, renowned for all over the country runs a great YouTube channel there called uh, Gun Dog and Rod and um, George kindly stayed on with us there last night and had a bit of a chat about uh, midge patterns and how to fish them and his experiences of fishing them on the river shore really interesting listen so uh, enjoy this one I'm going to take a little break get ready for the next couple of flies and I'll see you all back here in a few minutes for lots more midge <laughs> How you doing everyone and welcome to another Tackle Talk here with us in the Scary Fly. So tonight's been all about dry fly, midges and that kind of stuff. And, you know, <clears throat> when it comes to talking dry fly, especially those small stuff, there's no better place to go than down into Tipperary on the River Shore. And the one and only Mr. George McGrath has agreed to join us here tonight to share some of his um, well-recognised wisdoms on uh, midge fishing and, and fishing small stuff. How are you doing, George? Great to have you on with us here tonight. Peter, England here. Thanks very much for the invitation. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Thanks a million for Better coming on here, and sharing your, your vast knowledge with us again. <laughs> How are you keeping down there, Tipperary, George? Not a bother on me now. Great farm altogether. All ready Great for the fun. season? Yeah, looking forward to it now, Peter. I'm I've I tied my first few flies the other evening there, a few small dries as, as you're on the subject, you know. Lovely. Love the, love the small dries. Yeah, yeah. So tonight was as I mentioned in the intro there, George, it's kind of all about mage and, and small stuff. We tied a couple of flies there earlier on, and we're really going down in the sizes. Now, yeah, I, I, you know, I admitted earlier on in our pre-conversation before we start recording that, you know, I'll hold my hand up. It's not something I do a lot. I'm competition angler, so I tend to fish a lot during the day. There's a couple of evenings or, or mornings I'd be on the river and I can get a bit frustrating because they're not taking me sages and stuff like that. And I know in my heart and soul, they're probably on me, geez. Um, yeah. But I just, you know, haven't put the time and effort in. It's something I need to, to, to correct. But speaking to yourself, as I know you're, you're, you're you know, you're nationally recognized as, as a top dry fly man. When or how long ago was it for you when, when you kind of discovered that trout were on these small little you know, surface or sub, barely surface or subsurface midges or yeah. what was your first kind of experience of, of that kind of fishing jar? Well, the way I recollect it is, is this. I, it's a good few years ago now, I'd say it could be anything up to 20 years ago. And I was fishing normally, as I always did. I'd fish wet, dries, nymphs, everything. But I came across days and generally it was around about May. Right. from May onwards, and there were particular days where you'd come across what I would, could only describe as pods of trout. There'd be a, a lot of trout together. There could be anything, maybe 10, a dozen, up, anything up to 20 trout, and they'd, okay. be, they'd be barely breaking the surface. They, they'd be yeah. tiniest little dimples, right? But oftentimes I could see them, and I knew that some of them were good trout and they seemed to be competing with each other, but there was no evident fly life. There was nothing you could see on the surface that they would take. And I, I often tried now, I try a, a dry fly over them and cast and to inevitably yeah. put it down because 
and I, I didn't know what they were taking. I just didn't know what they were taking. But I knew by the dimples that it had to be something small. And I was searching the surface and looking to see was there were tiny little fly and I could see nothing. And like they frustrated me for quite a long time and I, could, I couldn't get on them at all. And I kind of, more or less by accident, more than design, right. I came upon a solution, right? And it was ab- absolutely just a pure accident. I tied what I considered was a very small nymph. And I actually have here to show you what I tied them with, right? Hey, right, come on. Just by experimentation, right? I came across... Well, the, the, the hooks I had at the time, the smallest hooks I had at the time were size 20s. I can't even remember what make they were. Right. What I did was, through experimentation, I was, I was trying different types of nymph fishing and all that, and um, I tied this little thing on a size 20 hook. I just put on a 1.5 millimeter gold bead. And yeah. this stuff here, which you would be familiar with, this is Kevlar thread, right? Which, as you know, is super strong and will cut your hands yeah. even. But... That's Kevlar thread in a natural color. And it's I a natural tan, to... kind of. It's a tanny kind of color. Yeah, is it's, it? kind of a, it's, it's a, like a kind of a beige color, if you like. Yeah. Uh, beige to tan color. It, it's called um, Kevlar Natural, made in the USA. I, I'm quite right. sure you have it there. But um, what I did was on a size 20 hook, I put on that tiny little bead. And then I just put on a few wraps of that behind it. Now, the whole thing in size would be possibly just around the size of the head of a match. Right. right? And I just tried it as, it, as a fishing it just as I, uh, my favorite nymphing technique, upstream nymph, and I'd be casting. And I caught trout on it in streamy water, right? Right. And I said, I wonder would it work on these pods that I described earlier on in the flats, you know? And I tried it and I caught it. Some of these pods were up to 20 and I often right. caught 15, 15 or more of them. I couldn't Way. believe it. I discovered something magical as far as I was concerned. Yeah. Because it, it, they had me so frustrated for such a long period of time. I, I just couldn't catch them. And now I had the answer. And I remember one morning I entered a competition here locally. And I knew it was in the month of May and it was an open yeah. competition. And I used to fish competitions back then. I don't fish them anymore. But I went, I knew where there'd be, if there were trout taken, these midges, I knew where they'd be. And I left the signing in for the competition at 11 o'clock. And at quarter past 11, I knew that I had the competition won. Because at that time, we used to kill fish. And I had, a le- had 11 fish in the bag over 10 inches. And I knew that there wouldn't anybody even approach that. And that was in the space of 15 minutes. And I caught a lot more besides those 11 that I'd killed. It, virtually every cast that was catching them. These totally unapproachable trout now are easy prey. You know what I mean? Right. In the sense. And like, it's not rocket science. It's very simple stuff, really. You know, it's just by accident, like I said, that I discovered the answer to it. And so I, that little, I, that little mage nymph or emerge or for one scrub, yeah. how deep was that fishing that day? I'd only be guessing. I, I'd only be guessing. Like, because when I cast it up to them, I was casting yeah. it into the bunch of them, if you like, or into the pot of them. And what, what I was like, I, I'd say if it was an inch under the surface, that's, that would right. be as deep as it went. Because it didn't get the chance to sink much <clears> before they'd taken it anyway. Okay, yeah, you know yeah. I mean? they, took, they took it immediately and it hit the water. It seemed to convince them utterly. You know what yeah. I mean? And it, it worked a dream, you know? Wow. So um, Kevlar tread and a very small hook. Um, I still tied the same thing and still use it, but I, I, I was going through a box of hooks and stuff I have outside uh, last year. Or actually, it was it the season before? And I came across these. These are TMCO, um, yes. TMC one one two Y for your information, and they're size twenty one. Right, right. And they are what I would consider the perfect size. They're actually a straight eyed hook, well, almost a straight eyed. Yes, I get you. With, with the very tiny bead, smaller, yeah. smaller bead as you can get, and only go down about halfway down the shank of the hook with the thread. That's all you need to do. And it's the simplest thing of all times. And yet, absolutely. I think that's an important factor to, to take into consideration. Anyone that's going to do a bit of midge fly tying or midge mm. fly fishing this year is, is simplicity when it comes to the patterns, George, can't be yeah. emphasized enough, isn't it? They really got to yeah. be so simple. Absolutely. So small. But I didn't even know at the time that they were taking midges. 
Now, I right. found out subsequently, I, I, I kind of did a bit of investigation into it, and I found out that what they're actually doing is they're taking the pupae before they hatch out, and apparently right. they hang vertically under the water. Now, whether oh, that's okay. significant or not, I, I don't really know. But the, hence the very small um, little blip that they make. They barely break the surface, and there's no hurry on them because yeah. these little midge pupa apparently take ages to hatch out, and they're easy prey for them. And um, if you if you're if you're ever on the shore, and I'm quite I'm quite certain that on virtually all rivers and lakes, etc. On the bulrushes in the shore, if you pull a bulrush during the summer, mm. on one bulrush, there will be several thousand. Yes. Mid-year. I mean, several thousand on just one bulrush. And, uh, and the shore gets, I mean, stuffed with bulrushes. So yeah. the numbers are astronomical. <laughs> so when, like we'll say, a lot of the other flies will say that I've known down through the years are becoming scarcer. Um, these ones seem to be growing in number. You can always rely on midges to be around. So it's important for an angler to, you know, to be, be ready to be have that Absolutely. potential go. So Absolutely. you're saying for May, May right through to the end of the season, George? Yeah, May right midges? through to the end of the season. Now, apparently midges hatch the whole year round, but to yeah. varying degrees. But it's when the weather apparently warms up, say around May, that they really start to hatch. And then you see them on the surface as well. No, when I, you're when I, you're talking about surface mage, then what kind of patterns yeah. or what kind of a uh, stuff are you, are you looking at for taking those fish that that are rare yeah. to take in, to present say or to replicate those surface mage? Yeah, it's not easy. No, it's it's very difficult <laughs> because when you get into the summer and low water conditions, right? And it's the places that the trout take these flies. You see, like. Right. Everyone heads for the streamy water because, let's yes, face it, you, you, you have an advantage because they can't see you, and if you make mistakes, you're less liable to be detected, all that. None of that is available to you when you're on the flats in the summertime because mm-hmm. the river is flowing slower than normal. It's lower than normal. Yep. The water is in clear. The trout can detect any little move, untoward movement, and, and let's face it, they're not going to tolerate, particularly on the shore, they don't tolerate that at all. If you make any little mistake, or if they know you're there, that's the end of it. Yeah. So it's not easy to catch them during the summer and um, when they're taking midges. And you'll right. see the midges hovering over the surface. Yeah, yeah. And generally, it's just black. Black. Basically black and small, as small right. as you can fit. But in my, experience, you, yeah. in my experience, fishing anything below size 22 is, in my view, a waste of time. Okay. It's almost impossible to hook a trout on anything smaller than a 22. That's my right. experience. Now, other people have a different experience. I fish down to 22. I've tried smaller flies. Hmm. I've tried them down to 24s, 26s, and they come up and take them, but I, I failed to hook them. You just pulled that hook right out. The, the hook just won't penetrate. It's just too yeah. small. You know what yeah. I mean? It doesn't work, you know. But the flies themselves, of course, you have the Griffiths gnat. Which yes. apparently represents a bunch of midges. A ball, a balling mage or, a ball, or something yeah, like that. That's a balling mage, mage, I think, is what they call it. Yeah. yeah. And that's a great fly, even in in outside of fishing midges, it just seems to work anyway. Oh, absolutely. Just, yeah. Jesus. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But I there was one fly that worked very well for me, was just a tiny palmer in a size 22 with just a black hackle. Right. A little black palmer. That's that's all it is. You could that's hardly nice. fit. You could hardly fit any thread onto the hook. Now, to mind the, the, the hackle, you know, you might. You yeah, get yeah. A very very small black hackle, and I clip it underneath. Okay. Because I found that if you didn't clip it underneath, you wouldn't hook them at all because the hackle prevents them being hooked. So I clip them underneath. So basically, you just have the bit of hackle on the surface. Yeah. Problem is, then you see, is the presentation. Well, that's, that's my next. I was going to lead on to what the hell yeah. are you going to use to present that? So you're talking. Let's say you're in high summer on the river shore. You're on one of those big flats. Um, you know, you got a few trout picking off midges in front of you. What's yeah. in your hand, George? What's what's what rod, line? You know, how yeah, fine in diameter are you going? You, there are a number of difficulties when when fish are taken in the places you've described. The first thing is is to be able to get anywhere near them at all, right? right. To be able to get into a position where you can cast 
with any effect to them. Because, yeah. because, because the river is so low, they're very difficult to approach. It's it, like the trout can be rising away quite steady to midges. And you can get in downstream 20 yards. And when the second you enter the water, he stops. Yeah. Somehow he's detected you. Mm. You know what I mean? It's the approach. What I do is I try, I try to use any vegetation in the water, any tiny islands or whatever, to, to get to use them between me and the fish to get as close as I possibly can. Yeah. When you walk through the water, you take you push a wave in front of you, just even in spite of as stealthy as you might like to think you'd be, you're still pushing a wave. Of course. The fish picks it up and you'll see him stop him. And you say, how did he know? But they can sense you by, by the movement of the water and they'll stop. So that's the real difficulty. But when you get into the position, then assuming that you can get into a position and he continues to rise, then you need very delicate equipment and a very delicate approach. Right. And like the rod I've been using for so many years, it's just, it's a nine foot three weight. Okay. And I'm very used to that rod. So I'm able yeah. to allow for any deficiencies in and in the system, if you like. I've overcome them just by being yes. used to the rod and using it for so long. Now, there are probably rods that would be better for it. You know what I mean? That might be more delicate, maybe. But the nine foot three that I have, like I say, I'm so used to it, I'm able to overcome the difficulties that, say, if I handed it to you, you might have. Yes, because I'm so. Yeah, yeah. I use a very long leader. How I long use, are you talking? I use a four. I, my system is very simple. I use this for virtually all the dry fly fishing I do. I use either 12 or 14 foot Maxima ultra green um, tapered leaders. Okay. And then I just attach to that, usually around a yard or four feet of either seven or eight X. I'd be using eight X in the case of the midges. And Roughly what different. diameter is your 8X that you're using, George? Oh, geez, it's very fine. Like, what? I'm not the that from... I'm not 0.08, that, I'm not that, probably. I'm not that good at that now, Peter. I wouldn't be able to say it. But <laughs> all I know is it'll go through the eye of a size 22. Hook. Right, that's fine. <laughs> that's yeah. as much as I can tell you. And is that but monofilament, ones, George? Is that monofilament, fluorocarbon? What is it? I use monofilament. I, I'm not a fan of fluorocarbon. I've... Being honest about it, I, I've tried it quite a few times and it, it's, I failed, but it's probably myself because I'm, there are particular knots that are good with it and I'm not good with new knots. I have a couple of old knots that I've been using <laughs> since time immemorial and I'm very low to change, you know? Yeah. So like fluorocarbon, fluorocarbon and me don't get along, you know? Me, I'm the very same. I'm the very same anyway. And would you... Put any treatments on that charge, or or do it in a towel with a bit. Well, of what I do, what I do in the case in the case of what I described earlier, fishing the tiny little midge with the bead on it. What I do is I grease the leader all the yeah. way down with muslin to within about a foot, right of the. We call it a nymph for the sake of argument, yes. although it's a pupae to be strictly speaking, and I grease it all the way to within a foot. That then stands up like a hawser on top of the water. You can see it's quite... Yeah, 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 yeah. I cast that upstream into those potted trout. Well, when I was a bit greener, what I used to do was I'd cast into the middle of the pod. I'd catch one, right? But what would happen then, he'd, the rest of them would go down. So what I did was I started to get clever and I'd start at the back and work my way right, up. Right, 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 right. You know what I mean? Uh, As you get older, you get clever. Well, some people do. <laughs> <laughs> so the grease leader is very easy to see. And when you drop it up to the trout, now, again, like... It depends on the day and it depends on the individual trout, but sometimes you'll see a positive dark forward of the yeah. of the nylon, or sometimes it'll be very it'll it'll vary in the in, in subtlety. Sometimes it's very subtle, and sometimes it's very obvious. And what happens is your eye becomes trained to it the more you do it, and you'll pick up on the more subtle things that are happening, you know. And the, the second I see anything or even sense anything happening, I'm lifting. And nine times out of ten, there'll be a fish there, you know. But like I said, don't panic when, they, when you see the potted trout and you cast your nymph up. If you cast into the middle of them, there'll surely one of them take it. Of course. And it'll, it'll always be the smallest one. So if you get clever, what you do is you pick them off one after another. Right. And you, work, you work your way through them and you'll catch the majority of them. That's what I found anyway. You know? Whereas oh, well. with the dry fly, with the dry midge, it won't be a pot of fish. It'll nearly right. always be an. It'll be a single fish. fish. And would you yes. would you would you stalk 
your fish when you're going dry fly midge and George? Like, would you walk the banks and be watching for something that's oh, absolutely. Yeah. particularly yeah. in the summertime, Peter? Because when you get into say late June, July, and August during the daytime, rising trout are very scarce. Of course, absolutely. And if you yeah. see, if you do see a rising trout, it's almost inevitable that he'll be taking midges, yeah. and he'll be there on his own. And then the difficulty, of course, is to get into a position to fish him. Catching him once you're in that position is relatively easy. It's to get into the, that's the oh, majority okay. of it, to get into the situation where you can cast to mm-hmm. him without him detecting you. Because normally what will happen is he'll detect you on your way to the approach, uh, as you're approaching him, trying to get into right. a position. So that's where the real skill is involved, is actually getting into that position. And that's where you learn to stalk. Yeah. And I think that's probably for, for me, for dry fly fishing or any type of dry fly fishing, the principal, the most important thing is to learn how to stalk. Okay. And the rest, the rest is re- relatively speaking easy. Right. If, Getting yes. in. And you were saying, as you mentioned earlier on, using your environment around you, you know, whatever it may yes. be, your advantage. Be, a, and, be aware, be aware of where the sun is. Right. Yeah, be ah. aware of where the sun is. Be aware of where the sun is. That's okay. one thing. I, because if, if, the, if, one, if the sun is to that side, you're casting a shadow that way. And yeah. vice versa, if the sun is on that side, it's casting your shadow that way. So let's assume for the sake of argument that I have a fish over here and I want to approach him, right? Yeah. And the sun is here. He's going to, you're going to cast a shadow there. And you may not, be, on a, you may not be aware of it because your sh- you won't see your shadow because it's down on the bed of the river. But he'll see it. Yeah. So really speaking, what I would do then is I would go to the other side of him where I know I'm not casting any shadow. And that's just right. one little advantage. You know, and you, you take into account currents and oftentimes I'd move just as he breaks the surface rather than move when he's not actively rising. Because when he's actively breaking the surface, then his mind is on that. A bit more distracted kind of in a way. Yeah, yeah. You, can move, you can move another yard forward at that point. And you're less likely to be detected than if he weren't rising, if that makes sense. Yeah. And how fast, and on a rising fish on midges, how fast have you got to beat them? You got to be pretty quick or you got to give them a second? I, I, they take very gently, but even though they take very gently, because I think because the fly is so small, they're taking it in very quickly, even though mm. it, it might not appear that way. And I strike immediately. And right. once they once they commit to it, oh, you'll you'll catch them. You'll, you'll, hook you'll them. get some like, uh, yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite close. I'm quite close to them. I, how close? I how how looking? Yeah, uh, what sort of distance are you away from them when you're looking to present a fly? I'd always try to be within two or three rod lengths, if at all possible. Right, that's that's pretty close. Yeah, yeah, and if you can get that close, like I say, and he continues to rise, then you're ninety percent of the way there. Right. You almost have him in the bag at that point. Just, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm using that, um, what do I call it, metaphorically, not in, really. You have him caught once you're in that position. Right. Because it's easy to fool him once you're there. It's the getting there, and I keep emphasizing that point, it's the getting to that place. That's where the difficulty arises. Okay, and yeah, that's yeah. That's where the real is involved. Yeah, and when uh, a lot of what you're talking, but that a lot of that play then as well, same principles and everything for for when the trout are on the canis, kind of you know they're kind of related. To oh, that. don't talk about that canis. That canis breaks yeah, my heart. They're the same. They're they're small. I think they're even smaller than a bloody major. Are they? Yeah, but it's yeah. not just the size of them that's the problem. It's the amount of them. Yeah, because when they fall on the river, like I mean, you're competing with multi thousands of them. Even yeah. if you're a fly, it's good. But, I mean, when you drop it down, it's a, you're dropping it in among 20 others. So, like, your chances of catching the trout, even if you have, like, if, if, there was, if, if they were so sociable as to just arrive one by one, well, then that would make it better. <laughs> they arrive in big bunches, you know what I mean? They arrive uh, yeah, in big yeah, bunches yeah. together. Like, when I see canis, I, I, sometimes I'm tempted to go home. I know. I, I, don't, yeah. fish, I don't fish canis because it's just too frustrating. Right, so right. Maybe, on lakes, it's different, but on the ri- yeah. on the river, like no, on the river, you're right. It is. Oh, it's so frustrating. You get the throw on the canis, and it is so hard to get. You know, I'm making life out of it. Time canis dries, 
it couldn't be simpler. You know, you're going a bit smaller. You got to go to the lower twenties, yeah. but at the higher twenties, should I say? But like they're yeah. very simple little lifestyle. But trying to get a throat on a to take it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just gave up on it. No, and I don't give up easily. But I give up on a canis. When I see them, I just shake my head. You know what I mean? But what often works when the cane is taken fly in? Because my father had showed it to me many, many years ago. I'm just trying to think of the name of the fly now. You'll be able to tell me what it is. Oh, a Wickham's fancy. Right. Can you believe it? Can you cool believe it? A Wickham fancy, right? A wet Wickham. Yeah, uh, great fly, thing. great fly. I, geez, I, I was born and reared fishing Wickham fancies with my dad. <laughs> a wet yeah. Wickham, a great fly. But now, I've tried it a few times and I, I got no good of it. But there was right. old boys here on the shore that swore by it, even when they were taking what they called the curse. The, the canis, yeah. they caught it the curse. When they're taking the curse, put it up a wickham. Now, they caught trout, or so they tell me, but I, I, I've i never caught. <laughs> Jeez, uh, <laughs> As I've seen lads tie canis where they take a longer shank hook and they actually put three or four canis on yeah. the one the one shank. I've seen that yeah. before, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, yeah I, think every, I think every, everything has been kind of uh, in order to try and crack the canis yeah, course, as we said. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of stuff being tried and tested over the years to, to you know, to, to <laughs> I don't think any of them are really successful though, Peter. No, you need a lot of luck on your side. It's just, it's just one of those things, like, and it's a challenge that I've tried to overcome, and I, yeah. I've given up on it, you know, basically. Right. And I, and I haven't, I, I'm low to give up on a challenge when it comes to fly fishing, but that one I have thrown me towel in and said, no. Well, I'm you know, not. you made a point, just put us back to bit with Mitch fishing and what you're talking about their challenge. This is a really important point. I think to get across to anglers, especially people that are getting into fly fishing or, you know, it is easy. And I've got to hold my hand up here. I'm one, I can be one of those guys sometimes. It is easy to go to the, to the, to the running water, high oxygenated water. As you said, you can get away with a certain degree of, of mistakes or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and catch quite a lot of fish during those summer months. But And it should be about the challenge too that, you know, go yeah. up there, folks, and, and hit these flats. You know, try and stalk your fish. The challenge is George the same as they're getting yourself into position, which is crucial. Like, you know, the yeah. angle of the cast, the whole thing about using your environment, being aware of your surroundings and tricking that throat basically into taking your fly when he's at the, probably the most advantageous of the two of you. Yeah. And, you know, it, it must be very rewarding, George. It must be. Well, it is. Most, you spot a really good trout there, say, on the shore. Yeah. Hot, high summer. He's feeding away midges. You're watching him for 30, from, from 20 yards away on the bank of the river, yeah. and he's just in a zone there feeding away. Yeah. And, you know, you spend the next 20 minutes getting into position, put the one perfect cast over him. He takes a size 20 midge that you put over him, and he yeah. takes it down, you lock up on him, and you, you, get, you get a hold of him in your hands. Yeah. It must be so rewarding, I'd say. Well, it? that's the sense of achievement, you see, because I, I, I give you an example. I know for a fact, right, there's parts of the river here I know where I could – go into the streamy water, say, with an yeah. upstream nymph or a Euro nymph and set up, right? And I know that I could come up through that, say, 100 yards of streamy water and catch maybe 20 or 30 fish, right? And I know that I can do that. But I would choose to go up the pool, up in front, where there's maybe two trout rising yeah, that are really difficult to catch. Because I get a far greater sense of satisfaction out of catching maybe one of those fish as opposed to the 30 I might catch down in the streamy water. I totally get I you. Got to mention, I got to mention one thing where, where where's a, that uh, I watch out for all the time. If you get your trout taken on the surface, your midges on the surface, and he's close to the bank, right. you're, you have a huge advantage then. You can fish him off the bank. Of course, absolutely, yeah. And you, you don't have all the difficulties of wading up and, and, and putting him on the alert. Provided that you use uh, some level of stealth as well, you, you can you can. They're, they're at a disadvantage when they're taking the 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 midge pool because they're very very high in the water, right. and their cone of vision is very much reduced. Oh yes, of course. The other, I it I don't think it's it's the, I don't think when you're approaching them in the water that it's they necessarily see you, they sense you in some other way. Yes, they're relying on those senses. Mm -hmm. More so, but if you're on the bank, that takes away that advantage that they have. So if you're fishing off the bank, if you if you see a, a, a midge feeding trout and he's close to the bank, you can stalk him on the bank, and there's very 
your chances are very much you have a good chance staying like yeah. better chance than were you in the water it's just something I thought yeah. I'd mention so when you're trying to identify when you're walking up along the bank or you're getting in your own May June what's mm-hmm. the telltale signs that that trout's feeding on the midge one you're saying is a very subtle little break in the surface yeah. sucking it it's, down or something like that when you're standing very, up over them are, are they moving or darting or is there, are, you're saying they're sitting high in the water as well they're very high in the water and it's a very gentle take and like oftentimes I've guided people say on the river right and I'd bring them and I'd say there's a trout rising up here and they'd say I didn't see anything yeah. well I'd say I, take it from me there's a trout because the dimple is so small Yeah. you need you need you need your eye needs to be tuned in. You know what I mean. Yeah. I've been looking at that for so long. I can I can see a trout rising, uh, even though I wear glasses. Despite the fact I wear glasses, I can see a trout taking a midge two hundred yards up the river. Yeah. Because like I can see a rabbit out in the countryside, and other people say, "Where is he?" You know yes, what I mean. Exactly. I, I've, yeah, I've been, yeah. I've been yeah. doing it so long. You know what I mean. I can see yeah, a rabbit yeah. see in the field, the silage. You know, and it's the same thing with the trout. You need. You need to tune your eye in and watch watch carefully for the slightest little dimple because when they take these either subsurface or on the surface midges, it's very very tiny. I mean, they barely right. break the surface. Yeah. And if you've done, you might it might be much more obvious if there's a pod of trout together. But when you have one trout say in a pool and he's up under the overhanging bank and he's taking midges, it's very easy to walk past him. Absolutely. You know? Or walk in on top of them, and next thing yeah, all of a sudden you see a good trout shoot out yeah. from underneath you, and you go, "Fuck it, there was trout." Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. That's fantastic, George. Well, look at Jesus. Right. Can't thank you enough for your, for your time as usual. You've been a great supporter oh, of the show, well. and uh, of course, if anybody wants to catch up with any more of George's uh, great knowledge, in-depth knowledge on on fly fishing the River Shore, and of course. Uh, gun dogs and training gun dogs. Um, yeah. Check out George's YouTube channel, Gun Dog and Fly. Fantastic channel there, George. You put up some great stuff there and a regular uh, post and regular stuff. So there's some really intriguing and, and some great stuff on there. Um, so do check that one out there, folks. We're going to head back up now in a moment to tie another couple of uh, small little um, little fish catchers, hopefully. So once again, George, anyway, look at, we wish you all the best for the coming season. Looking forward to catching up with you in a day or springs. I know you're going to be yeah. over there tying flies in yeah, a day or make sure it. anyone that turns up, go down to see George. George's going to be on fly tires row. He'll tell you all yeah. the 22 as you went. Um, yeah. So do tap up George for loads of little midge patterns. Uh, brilliant. Look at George. Good night. Yourself, That's sir. And uh, we, we'll be talking to you soon. And uh, thanks a million again for your time. It's a long time. So we're back. That was George McGrath, folks. Um, George has a fantastic YouTube channel there if you want to check out more from George. Uh, Gun Dog and Fly, it's called. Brilliant interview there with George. As the man has, when it comes to river dry fly fishing and, and fishing rivers in general, the man's wealth of knowledge is just untouched in the country. Uh, fantastic. And thank you so much, George, as always, for coming on and being a supporter of the show here and uh, kindly sharing their knowledge. Really appreciate it. Hope everyone enjoyed that. I was able to take a few things out of it. Of course, don't forget, George is going to be tying for the two days at the Irish Spring Angling Fair um, from the 30th of April to the 1st of May. There's a two-day fair going on down at Air Springs in Mooncoyne. If you book your tickets uh, online before the show, you have a chance to win a VIP weekend. So make sure and uh, get online there and book those tickets. Or you can also pay to gate, folks. Uh, <clears throat> it's going to be a fantastic weekend. There's a host of fly tires from all over the country going to be there tying, tying, and it's going to be fantastic. We're going to be there too. And we hope many people will come and join us that weekend. It's going to be a great weekend. So let's get back onto a few more flies. So Dave asked a question. What was the I-O-B-O stand for? That's our next fly. We're actually going to tie it. It is, it ought to be outlawed. It's so good. It, they named it It Ought to Be Outlawed. Okay, Dave, let me know who won that prize, will you? Whoever won it is going to win themselves. Uh, <laughs> Andrew, yeah, good Tipperary, man. No, no more Tipperary than George McGrath, I can tell you. Uh, fantastic guy. Thanks a million again, George. But um, It Ought to Be Outlawed. It, it, it's that good. And it is pretty good, folks. I tell you, I fished it and it is it is good. You can tie it in a few sizes. Uh, this one's going to be tied in a size 20. Uh, around a size 20 hook anyway um, but a very very good fly and one well worth having in the box start off here with a little bit of Kevlar this is the Haku 301 again 
and putting on a nice fine layer of Kevlar on there. How you doing, Chris Oliver? It'll be up on YouTube tomorrow for you, Chris, if you wish. I'll get it up on YouTube tomorrow morning. Uh, well, my lovely wife will get it up on YouTube tomorrow morning. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you can watch it back there, Chris, if you wish. Uh, thanks for, for watching. Don't forget to win tonight's flies. All you got to do is share that stream or, or stick in a comment. I got a nice, full, fine... Um, how you doing, Ernie? Good to have you on with us there, Ernie. Uh, a nice, full CDC feather, small... And I'm going to take off that heavy butt end. Okay. And just clean it back. Bring your tread up near the eye. And secure in that CDC feather like so. Bring the tread down. Three quarters of the way down the hook is fine enough for me. I don't bring it anymore. And now take a little bit of grey sharpie. And I'll just touch that Kevlar with grey sharpie for the moment. Do it now. If you don't, trust me, you'll regret it in a few moments. Okay. We didn't take our hackle pliers. If I brought one, I did. I did. I brought one. And I catch the point of the CDC feather. And we start winding down the hook. Now, as we wind down the hook, we stroke all those CDC feathers out the back. And as I said, you're winding down. Nice and slow. Don't be in a rush. As you will snap the tip of that CDC feather quite easily. Touch and turns down the body that right. Till you get roughly down. I wouldn't go the full length of the hook. But keep all those strands going out the back. So the winner, Dave's on there. The winner was Owen Emma Deegan. Well done, guys. All the way from British Columbia. But luckily enough, you're back home to us. And uh, you guys have just won yourselves. Owen and Emma were down with it, down with me here today. We got to meet for the first time today. Lovely people. Uh, very enthusiastic about the fly fishing. So you guys, I'm going to be in touch with you tomorrow to get your prize, which is a day's fishing on Adair Springs. Courtesy of Ned Maher, of course. Thanks very much, Ned. So one or two turns over the top there. Now you can snip it off. I'm going to leave it on there for the moment. And just unravel it a bit. Get all those feathers tapered back. Out of butterfly. This is why I, I colored it grey. Okay, going to give it a bit, bit of a spin. Going to give it a bit of a spin to make it as fine as I possibly can. And I'm going to bring my tread. Back up. We didn't catch... That tail of CDC sticking out the back, and we bring it straight over the top, like so. One or two turns on top, one turn in underneath, and that is the fly. How you doing, Betty? Thanks very much, Betty. Betty Hayes there, Michael. Hope you guys are keeping well. Little bit of a whip finish, and that is the fly. It's so good, it ought to be outlawed. Great name for a fly. Simple little thing, if you want to shorten down this up here, pinch it between the finger and thumb on one side and pluck it out with the other. Do not cut it with the scissors. I always like that natural break. And there we have it, folks. Now, that can also be tied with... Uh, how you doing, ma'am? Ma'am's on there as well. Hope you're keeping well, ma'am and dad. Uh, a little bit of crystal flash sticking out the, out the butt there can be quite effective too. But that is one hell of a midge. Probably one of the greatest midge patterns that was ever tied. Um, absolutely lethal. Floats like crazy. Pure simple tie. One CDC feather. About half an inch of trade. The job is done. If he's haven't fished that before. You're very welcome on Emma. And I hope he's enjoyed the day down there with Ned. Um, <clears throat> if you haven't fished that little midge before. I tell you no folks you're missing out. That thing is absolutely lethal. Uh, really really well worth doing. Uh, well worth tying. Very simple. Just be selective enough with your CDC feather. So there we go. There's another one there now folks. Uh, we're going to move on now. And we're going to do a little beaded one. A little emerging. You heard George talking about, you know, upstream fishing, those micro nymphs and stuff like that. And I know there's a couple of lads on here that'd be really good. Kevin or Sean, Sean Maher, for one, two time All Ireland champion, Sean Maher has. I've watched him fish, fishing micro nymphs upstream at distance, and it's lethal. It's absolutely getting that, as George said, getting that just under the surface and throw taking them as emergers. We're going to do one of those little midges here now for his um, little midge emergers with a bead. And it's going to take me a second here now just to root out what I need. But um, can be very, very... Um... Hi, Mark. How did you get on today, Mark? 
Mark Williams there from Wales, a good friend of ours here on the show, who was on the river today. He said, I hope you did well, Mark, and enjoyed yourself. Miles Riley, good question. Is there a difference between dry fly and wet fly dumping for small river dries? Or does it work? No, it pretty much works the same, Miles. You know, different, different, um, thanks, Ricky. Different dubbins can have different effects on the way your fly swims in the water. Okay, but there's no real great difference. It depends on, what would you say, the finish of the fly, the look of the fly, the way you want it to swim in the water will depend on whether it's going to float or sink. Um, now, obviously, stuff like snowshoe rabbits can flow, be a lot more buoyant than um, muskrat can be an awful lot more buoyant than, say, hair dubbing and stuff like that because it's it's a water creature and it has natural oils in the fur to help it float. But uh, no, not particularly. No, not particularly, unless it's something specific. Now, I'm just trying to pick out 1.5 mil bead here, folks. Um, 1.5 mil bead. Going to stick it on the size 20. Ah, oh, hell, would I go with a size 22? I'll go to, I was thinking there, I'll go with the 20. No, I'll go with, I will go with a 22 for this one. Hope everyone's enjoying their weekend and having a good weekend. It's great to be, as I said earlier on, great to be getting out this, this side of the air. You might, this might take a few moments here now, folks. I'm going to put a 1.5 mil bead on a size 22. So you can't see what I'm doing. But it's uh, you can see the hook on the finger. You can see the well, you can't even see the bead. It's that small. But just bear with me for a moment there now, and we might just get lucky here and get this on the first go. Man, that's small. Wished. There we go. Happy days. No. Gonna be able to get that. That's just <laughs> tweezer job. Not this time, and I'm gonna stick it on a twenty just to just for the show to make it life just that little bit easier on myself. <clears throat> That's a very small hook and a very small bead. There we go. Okay, so stuck it in a size 20. It'll make for better view, and anyway, you can see that hook a little bit better. But no, all right, very good. Was it, um, was it Graylin, Mark? Obviously, yeah. Graylin, any good ones on it? Never heard of that river. Uh, now, let me think what I'm going to do here, right? So, we're going to go switch to Black Trade. So, we got our small little bead, a little bit of Black Trade. As George was saying, you know, very small, very simple little nymphs work quite well in this situation. Now, I have tied this one before for a few people, and I do have it in my box myself. What I'm going to do is add a little tail here. The tail is going to be very fine pearl taken out of microglint. So I just opened up that microglint, took out a very fine little piece of pearl. As you can see, nice and fine. Uh, spec savers absolutely Brendan and uh, new fingers my skin is really bad at the moment I've always suffered from really bad I spent years working in the bills but I don't think that was cause of it I, I, I do have a bit of eczema and I've always had had it quite bad as a child got a bit better over the years but in my adult life it actually came back it's it's really it can be very annoying and frustrating at times um, and my hands break out sometimes so my skin is very flaky I get awful cracks and stuff in my fingers and it can be quite sore sometimes and unfortunately it does not help me with fly tying i've often had to sand down my fingers before i go tie flies to sand off all the rough skin and stuff um but uh, it can be a bit of a pain in the backside um sometimes when you're doing the small or stuff so for a rib we're going to add in a red rib as well so what i got here again is i've got some um uh, micro or uh, micro glint and i open up that micro glint and i take the red out of the middle take that lovely you won't buy red as fine as that not for stuff this small same as the chris as the little tail out the back you won't buy materials on spools or in hanks that fine for small little stuff like this you're going to have to get it from somewhere else so i take it out of the the micro a little bit curled up there to start but that's okay we'll straighten it once i get it tied in and there we go hold everything out the back 
Three quarters of the way down the hook is more than enough. Wind your thread back up. I take the little bit of red. And I just put two or three turns up there. <laughs> Go on, Dick. Ah, you'll be all right, Dick. You'll see them all right. You could always have Ricky standing beside you, Dick. And he'll tie the man for you while you catch the trout. Uh, so there we go. Anyway, that's the rib. As you can see, a nice little subtle red rib coming up. You're not going to buy stuff that fine, I suppose. Not that I've seen anyway. And if anyone has, they can, they can kind of share it. Um, not that fine. Get in there and snip away that little bit of uh, waste. Cut off your tail nice and short. Don't want much. And there we go. Sometimes I'd even... Put a little bit of a CDC hackle on that maybe. Just take out maybe three or four little strands of CDC off the stem and tie them in either side just to act like a kind of wing shuck or something to give it a little bit more of a natural look to it. But that's all it'd be. Wooden resin it. Um, sink too quick if I resin it, but I would put a little bit of varnish on it. Um, actually, not even varnish. I'll put a bit of lacquer. Okay, so lacquer is much finer than varnish and it soaks into the material much better. So it's not going to um, create a you know, that perdigon kind of thing. That, but it's going to be just enough just to give that a little bit of protection. So if I do manage to get two or three fish on it, well then, these little bottles from uh, Tommy Fly, we get these little bottles from Tommy Fly, they have a lovely little needle on them. And when you dip them in, they come out, um, uh, uh, Jerry, I've tried so much stuff on my hands and, it, uh, and eczema over the years. It's, um, geez, I tell you now, and I don't know what really brings it on. It could be anything at all. Like, you know, if I go work and give someone a hand on the buildings for a few days, they can get quite bad. And sometimes they don't. Sometimes I'm in the river a lot. They'd be quite bad. Um, I've tried, I've tried everything. I've, tr I've tried so much stuff. Uh, I got a real good uh, bee, a natural bee kind of cream one time. I ordered it online. And that was actually pretty decent. Um, It was pretty decent. But, Jesus, some of them cracks can be queer sore. And when I used to be on the bill, I used to use super glue. I used to super glue them closed because it's the only way you could stop it from, from getting any bigger. Um, but there we go, folks. That's a lovely little midge nymph right there. Um, lovely little midge nymph. Very, very effective for exactly what George was talking there as well. You know, super light. Um, again, see Sean Mar fish and stuff like that. The lethal on them. Uh, if the fish are fishing at that zone, the likes of Sean and them Tipperary lads, you just can't keep up with them. They, they, they'll bring fish to the net all day. Um, skilling themselves. One, I, I might actually just spend a bit of time on this year working on, but um, really, really good little things to have in your pockets. You know, fishing in those environments that George talking about, those still waters. And, you know, the satisfaction you'll get out of catching those trout would be phenomenal. But um, there we go, folks. By the way, when I was on with George... You know, it's February now, and I was just thinking, Jesus, you know, I was thinking back, that has been great. We've had so many great people on, so many great guests, We've, you know, from all over the country. And it's brilliant to get people on and come on and share their information. And fair play to you all. Uh, I'm not going to mention it all now. We'll, we'll do all that when we get to the last show. But there's only six shows left. Six shows left to the 12th of March. And then, of course, it's St. Patrick's weekend. And I'm sorry, but I'll be too busy going fishing. I'll probably do a show somewhere over the summer months, all right, just to check in, which is all. But only six shows left of this series. I don't know how many we're up to. I must have a look how many we're up to. Uh, being a great being a great winter series this year. Uh, still six good shows left to go. So we're on here every Saturday night live, folks, at half eight. If you wish to join us, you're more than welcome. We love having you on. We love all the comments, all the feedback. Uh, so please do. If anyone's got any ideas or anything you want to see, please shoot them across to us. Don't forget, if you're looking any looking for any fly fish and fly tying gear, uh, check out www.scarryfly.com. we got a new web, whole new big website coming soon. and Can't wait to get it up and running and working hard at the moment. But the old one is still there. If you're stuck for any information or want some advice on any gear coming into the season, uh, by all means, give us a show here in Piscari Fly. Drop down and see us here and we'll make sure you're kitting out properly and you have the right stuff going out in March or February. Um, so look, going to leave you there, folks. I hope you've had it all. A good evening. Thanks, Tim Sullivan. Uh, thanks James, thanks everybody for coming on Thanks Dave Dunham for his trivia uh, Didn't didn't see too many answers coming in there now But well done to the guys that won it And uh, folks enjoy the rest of your weekend Stay safe everyone And I am going to head on now I'm going to see the wife for a few minutes I haven't seen her much of the week So I'm going to have a chat with the wife And um, I'll see you, thanks Miles I'll see you all real soon Take care everyone and good night <laughs>